Thank you very much. Thanks, Marina, for that lovely introduction. And um, thank you to everybody at MBIF for the invitation to come and tell you about the work that we've been doing, um, both in San Diego and now at Flinders University. This is Flinders University, you can see. Um, we're in Adelaide in South Australia, so on the southern side of Australia. So today I'm going to tell you about um, some of our new advances we've made and some of the challenges um, that we're dealing with, with understanding viruses. Um, and I am no longer on X, but you can catch me on either Blue Sky or Mastodon, depending on which one you prefer. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that I'm on Ghana land and that the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains are the traditional custodians of this land. And I pay my respects to their elders, both past, present and emerging. In my group, we do two things. We develop lots of bioinformatics software. Um, we've developed many of the tools that you've probably used to analyze bacterial and viral genomes and metagenomes. Um, and we focus especially on phage genomes as well. So um, we've put together lots of different tools for taking metagenomic data, for taking prophage data, or for taking isolate phage data, and then for taking that through all the way to complete annotations and, in, and environmental analyses. Um, we've put both of these together into pipelines um, for Oka by George Burris at University of Adelaide and SPAY um, by NP from my group. We'll take your raw data, process it, and generate completely annotated genomes um, out of that. Uh, but today I want to tell you about our work really on viral metagenomics um, and some of the advances that we've been making in trying to understand what's going on with the virus here. It, it's really difficult to culture viruses. Culturing phages is slightly easier than culturing eukaryotic viruses. Um, but basically, uh, the way that we're really understanding what's going on in the virus sphere these days is through deep DNA sequencing. One of the things I want you to think about is that um, each virome is slightly different and there are different things that you need to worry about um, when you're comparing those different viromes. So for example, you might have a host dominated virome. So if you're taking a sample from a person, if you're taking a biopsy sample, um, if you're taking a sample from a sputum, a sputum sample, something like that, you're going to have a lot of human DNA in there. Similarly, if you're getting a sample from an animal, a coral reef, something like that, you're going to have a lot of host DNA that you need to, to process and remove. Many of the other samples that we work with um, have host DNA in them. So, for example, fecal samples, you can see a lot of host DNA in there, but they're really dominated by bacteria. And then if we go to some um, more purely bacterial dominant environments, um, then we don't really worry so much about the host. We're really um, exploring the, the bacteria that are there. And so before we begin any kinds of analysis, we need to think about those kinds of questions about what kind of sample are we looking at. The way that we do the extractions is um, relatively simple and relatively straightforward for each different environment. We start by homogenizing our sample, we clarify it, we do some filtration, um, we do some concentration using beaver spin columns, and then take it through to DNA sequencing. But one of the things that I want you to remember when we're talking about virus sequencing is that we're doing enriching, we're not doing purification. And so we start with, for example, a human sample, a fecal sample. Um, we might do some filtration that gets rid of a lot of the bacteria. If we're doing a marine sample, it will get rid of the sharks and the whales out of the sample. But we're not getting rid of everything. Remember that there are small bacteria, almost as small as viruses, and there are large viruses, almost as big as some of the bacteria. And so depending exactly how you do these filtration steps, depending on depends on what will come through. We do some um, 
some enzyme digestions, depending exactly what you're trying to get, we might try and um, either remove the bacteria with some lysozyme or remove the free DNA with some DNAs. Um, and then we get our total nucleic acid extractions. Um, in our lab, we do quite a lot of minion sequencing. This is Sarah that does a lot of our sequencing for us. Um, and we like the minions, especially for sequencing phage and viral metagenomes. But it's also important to remember that not all phages, not all viruses are double-stranded DNA. So we don't actually start with double-stranded DNA. We start with a mixture of things. And if we're interested in exploring the RNA viruses, then we've got to do a cDNA synthesis. If we're interested in exploring the single-stranded DNA viruses, we've got to do a second strand synthesis. Because remember, DNA sequencing works best if you've got double-stranded DNA. And then we take that through to our Hecatomb bioinformatics pipeline. So let me just talk a little bit about viral bioinformatics for a second. And basically, the way that we visualize it is like this. In theory, what we would really like is to have kind of a balance between the amount of computing that's required and the amount of data that we generate. So that when we generate the data, we can analyze all of that data really quickly. Um, what we often find is that um, we might have low quality data, we might have um, inappropriate or less effective search strategies, um, and not enough compute resources to really analyze all of that data. And so we start cutting some corners to try and analyze the data. There are alternative approaches where people throw massive amounts of HPC uh, and computing resources at data. Um, and then there they've got lots and lots of resources and they're crying out for your data so that they can help you to do the analysis. With Hecatome, what we were trying to strive for is that balance where we've got just the right amount of data and just the right amount of computing resources for effective computation. So this pipeline was built by Scott Hanley, who's at Washington University in St. Louis, and Mike Roach, and Mike's a postdoc with me here at Flinders University. And basically some of our guiding principles were to try and choose the databases appropriately to um, take advantage of some of the newer um, tools, tool sets that we've got, things like SnakeMake, that allow us to, to um, separate things into smaller chunks and to do lots of consecutive computing very efficiently. So um, Hecatomb has been built to, build, to create that pipeline for you to basically take the reads to process the reads, um, do some QC and QA on the data, and then to run straight into virus identification using a bunch of databases that we built. We've also worked really hard on thinking about host removal and identifying host DNA, not just from humans, but from lots of other things. We do lots of work on, on marine animals here, um, but also on other animals that you might be interested. And so Hecatomb will do all of that for you in a, in a really straightforward and seamless pipeline that is easy to install and really straightforward to run. Once you've run Hecatomb, you get the output that allows you to make kind of really interesting graphs like this data set here, um, which comes from an IBD data set. And so this graph on the top left shows the different kinds of viruses that we see and the number of reads that map to each virus. And we've got about 10,000 uh, reads that map to this particular family of viruses, um, about 1,000 that map to the Picobinoviridae, um, all the way down to um, just 100 reads down here. And we can plot just the, the raw read counts, or we can plot a simple graph like this one where we've got, on the y-axis, we've got the percent similarity. And on the x-axis, we've got the alignment length. And what we're showing here is that we have some really um, novel 
uh, uh, viruses. We've got either maybe um, some short hits that are very, very similar to things that we know about, or we've got some long hits that are similar here, or like if we look at the Pico Bionaviridae, for example, we have some very long hits, but they're, they're very dissimilar to things that we know about, so they're probably new viruses. Um, and then you can see the different families of viruses, the kinds of things that we're learning from them. What we love about Hecatomb is that we can make all kinds of exciting plots, like this one on the y-axis here, we've got different patient samples, and on the x-axis, we've again got alignment length of our DNA or our protein alignments, and we've colored them so the red are the protein alignments and the blue are the DNA alignments. Of course, protein alignments are a third the length of DNA alignments, and that actually helps you to kind of discriminate things. And you can see that some of our patient samples have more families of viruses, um, are more dominated by some viruses than other patient samples. And so Hecatomb really allows us to do a deep dive into our data, to get in there and really try and understand what's going on with our data sets. But one of the problems that we have with our data sets is that we're working with viruses. And still, there's so much that we don't know about viruses. So this is a graph that we made in 2005, so nearly 20 years ago. And we had um, some uh, samples. There's a fecal sample and some um, water and sediment samples from uh, San Diego, in California. And the green bar here is how much of our samples were completely unknown. And 20 years ago, about 60 to 70 percent of our viral samples had no similarity to anything in the database. Well, you know, in that 20 years, we've done a lot of sequencing. And our databases have grown so many, many times over. So surely now we must be better. So this graph shows the um, phage genomes. So from all of the phage genomes that are available, um, we just created this graph just a few weeks ago, and it shows the frog categories of all the proteins in different phage genomes. And you can see integrase and excision. You can see head and packaging, uh, the assembly um, proteins, lysis, obviously, auxiliary metabolic genes, transcription. But look, almost half the genes in phages, we have no idea what they're doing. And so one of the things that we've been working on for a long time is how do we overcome this massive amount of unknown data set, uh, of unknown sequences in our data sets. And back or oh, nearly a decade ago, Baz Dutil was working with, with us and Baz came up with this idea that he called cross-assembly, where we take our metagenomes and we label them. Here I've colored them so you can see, but obviously we don't really do that. And we combine the metagenomes using sequence assembly. And then we can really just simply take those contigs from the sequence assembly and plot the coverage across different samples. So here on the x-axis, I've got our different samples. These, in this case, are fecal samples. And on the y-axis, we've got our depth of coverage of those reads. And you can see pretty clearly that there's this group of contigs that have very, very similar coverage across different samples. We could pull those contigs out. We could pull the reads out that map to those contigs. We could reassemble them. And of course, that's what gave us crass range. That was 10 years ago, and more recently, I've been working with Virginie Maralachi, who's another postdoc in my group, and Virginie um, went back to that assembly process and said, you know, we can do a lot better. And when you think about DNA sequence assembly, we start with complete genomes, we shear them up, we break them up, we fragment them, we sequence them, and we have little reads. We do the sequence assembly, and one of the things that that generates is the genome assembly graph. Now, all too often when we do the genome assembly, we just ignore that graph. We might look at it in bandage. I'll show you some of that in a second. But we ignore that graph. 
we just take the contigs and we say, oh, we're done. And Virginia said, you know, we're really throwing away a lot of useful information from that graph file. And so Virginia has developed a tool which is called Fables, which takes these graphs. These are those bandage plots that I promised you. We take those graphs and we can run them through Fables and we can identify individual phage genomes. Now, I'm going to start with a simple example. Let me just take this example right here in the middle and um, I'll walk you through the steps that we take with Fables. So the first thing we do is we calculate the read coverage around the graph. So in this particular graph, we've got 5x coverage of the gold fragment, 3x of the blue and 2x of the purple. So we just linearize that fragment and we create two graphs. It's pretty easy to then deconvolute that and say, okay, we've got a, a bluish one and a pinkish purple one. And obviously we're gonna have 3x coverage of the purple version and 2x coverage of the pink version. And that together creates that 5x coverage that we've seen. This is a pretty simple case. We sometimes see a little bit more complex cases like this one, but luckily, Virginia has written beautiful code that can take these complex cases and deconvolute them into separate phage genomes. And though, so in this case, we could show that there were three phages. Typically, what we find is three kinds of components. We find phages like this, where we'll just get a complete circular genome out of the assembly. It's complete, it's a phage and we're off and running, we don't need to worry. Very often we find cases where we just have this small little contig that has a little um, repetitive sequence. And if you were to ignore the assembly graph, you would, you would say that this is a complete genome um, and you would just throw away this small fragment. But by looking at the assembly graph, it soon becomes obvious that that's the direct terminal repeat that the phage is using to integrate into the genome. It's a lysogenic phage, a temperate phage that gets into the genome. And obviously with this data, we can now pull out the complete genome and we can pull out its insertion site. Isn't that great? And then we see cases like the one that I just walked through that are a little bit more complex, but we can resolve those into individual um, components. Of course, as anybody that's done sequence assembly knows, it's not always that obvious. And we have more complex cases like these, and Virginia is working um, very hard to improve the uh, deconvolution of these much more complicated cases and expect some updates to fables that will be able to resolve these in the future. So, Here's an example of a case where we were able to identify a phage. This is from that same IBD data set that I showed you with Hecatum. We could deconvolute the phage, we can run it through Faroka, and we can get a complete phage genome annotation. When we look at our IBD phages, um, we get lots of complete genomes. We can separate them out into, frag into different families um, and we get complete genomes of different genome sizes. But we don't only see phage bubbles in uh, fecal samples from IBD patients. We see them in samples from shark's teeth and shark skin and shark feces and everywhere else we look. And then just recently on X, um, Ilnam Kang um, posted this uh, comment about being able to resolve their assembly graph into complete genomes, and then um, wondering what to do next. So what do we do next? Well, obviously the next thing what we wanna do is we wanna work on the annotations. And so that brings me to some work that Susie Grigson, a PhD student in my group has been doing, this is Susie. And um, Susie looked at this genome annotation. This is the same genome that I just showed you and said, you know, this looks pretty good. It's a nice figure and Farrakh has done a good job of annotating it. But look, we still have all these unknown functions. How can we make this better? And so 
Susie realized that if we take phage genomes and we linearize them and then we orient them so that the integrase is always at the left end of the phage genome. That may be the left end on the camera, but it's always at one end of the phage genome. So always over here, we've got the integrase and then we've colored the rest of the phage genes by their functions. You can see that there's a very strong conservation. There's this sort of region here with the DNA, RNA, nucleotide metabolism, the, the, um, and the head proteins, maybe some transcriptional regulation involved. Here, um, we've got uh, some of the packaging genes, and obviously here in yellow, we've got the tail genes. You can see there's this really conserved um, order of phage genes. And so Susie, um, used a machine learning approach called a long short-term memory model. Um, and that's the one that you use every day when you use predictive text on your phone, when you start typing a message or when you're on Twitter or when you're on Blue Sky and it fills in the message for you. It's the same type of idea. And so Susie has um, written software to encode phage genomes and to use the information in the, the synteny to try and predict those functions. And so we start, for example, with a linearized genome. Here's a genome with some unknown functions and a few that maybe we know. And using this LSTM model, we can start to fill in the functions of the genes that we didn't know. So we can take a lot of genomes, we can do those kinds of analysis, and we can show um, that the Originally, we do okay, but you know we could do better. And then after adding Fintany, we get a much higher number of genes annotated. So we're coming up with new annotations for proteins, not based on similarity to existing proteins, not based on anything else, but based on their order in the genome. And that leads us to an obvious question. How do we know those annotations are any good? And so uh, Susie took some of the predictions, and here are three predictions. Um, here's a, a protein we predict to be a tail fiber. Here's a protein we predict to be involved in DNA metabolism. And here's a protein we predict to be involved in integration and excision. And we use ColabFold to generate the structures of those proteins, and then FoldSeq to search through the database of known protein structures from all of the AlphaFold predictions. And what we find, of course, is that we get great overlap between our predicted proteins in blue and the known structures in gold. And so um, we're using the primary, the, the, uh, the new predictions from AlphaFold to come up with better annotations of our phage genomes. And that leads me to the last little vignette I want to tell you. Um, and this is a story that uh, was done by NP, by Bavia, a P another PhD student in my group, and NP was looking at crassphage. I mentioned crassphage earlier. You all have crassphage. It's everywhere you look. Everybody has it. Um, and we've, we identified it first in about 2014. We published the paper. And then it took a while before anybody could culture it. Um, Andrei Shkoparov and, and Colin Hill's group in Ireland published the first isolates of crassphage. This year, we published another four isolates, um, and there was another lovely Nature micro paper where they published 25 crassphage isolates. How exciting is that, that we now have some crassphages we can start to work on and do some really cool science with? So we found the crassphages by going to wastewater, by spotting wastewater on bacteroides by doing some phage extractions, uh, Illumina sequencing or nanopore sequencing, and running them through our SPAE pipeline. We, we found several isolates. Um, we, uh, we categorized them um, using Crassus from Baz's group, and um, we showed that we had three species that belong to a couple of different families, and those are shown here in these beautiful um, TEMs that you can see. And those uh, phages also have different um, 
different functions that you can see just from the plates. You can see that this phage makes a lot of depolymerase, has a lot of depolymerase activity, um, whereas these plaques don't have such activity. When we compared those phage genomes, um, and this is just a clinker pot of three uh, different genomes, we found that there was a couple of proteins that had really conserved um, structural similar, uh, sorry, protein similarity. And remember that these three phages all infect the same bacterial strain. So they're all infecting a specific strain of bacteroides. And these three, uh, sorry, these proteins that have highly conserved protein structure come from that central um, tail fiber protein that you can see in these beautiful TEMs down here. And so we hypothesize that since these phages are all infecting the same strain, that potentially these proteins are required for the phage to get into the bacteria. So we solved the structures of the proteins using AlphaFold. We didn't solve the structures. We predicted the structures using ColabFold. Um, and this is the, the structure of the spike protein. And then we compared this structure with all of the structures from the bacteroides genome. And luckily, all of those structures were already available from the AlphaFold database. So we just had to download those structural predictions um, from the Google Cloud, from the AlphaFold in the Google Cloud. And then we used HDoc. So we're doing pairwise comparisons of, of proteins against proteins. And in fact, when we did this, we did all 100 bacterial prote uh, phage proteins against all 3,500 bacterial proteins. So we've got three and a half million comparisons that we're doing on the supercomputer um, here in Australia. And by doing that massive amount of computation, we were able to convince ourselves that this tail spike protein interacts with the TOMB dependent receptor on the surface of um, bacteroides, and that um, we're now trying to show that experimentally and confirm these predictions. So what have I told you? I've told you that we've got some new pipelines for annotating phages. Hecatomb now includes fables. Um, so that's a, a seamless integration, um, and we're building that out to include, uh, to step straight on to Farocca and Spay. But the problem is that now our bioinformatics tools are really outpacing our experimental biology. We can identify complete phage genomes from metagenomes, but we don't know what those phages are infecting, and we have no evidence that those phages are really real no experimental evidence. So how can we think about experiments to, um, to test the hypotheses that we're coming up with? And I told you that we can predict phage bacterial interactions. That's one of the big challenges that we have. We're great at doing that, or not great, but we can do that at protein level. But then how do we do that at the LPS, at the sugar level, the carbohydrate level that's so important for those first steps of phage bacterial interactions. We don't know at the moment, but we're working on it. Um, so I'm gonna finish that and I'd be happy to take any questions, but before I do, I wanna just thank this is my approach. Um, this is, here's Bijani over here, Susie, NP, Roshemek from Poland. This is George that wrote Faroka. Laura, I didn't unfortunately have time to tell you about her work on the human uh, microbiome associated prophages, which is amazing and we'll have out soon. Um, I need to thank the team that were involved in the IBD biome, especially um, Dave Wang and Scott Hanley in St. Louis, Miles at Adam Brooks Hospital um, in Cambridge, Mike Diamond also in St. Louis, Anka Segal at San Diego and Liz Dinsdale here in Flinders, and um, all of our team here at Flinders and all of the funding agencies that have supported my research. 
And I'm just going to um, take a moment of your time to remind you and invite you to come to Cairns in July of 2024 to come to the Viruses of Microbes meeting. It's going to be a great meeting, um, and uh, there'll be both some uh, amazing science and some really great uh, sort of cultural events, and I encourage you all to come. So thank you very much. I'll be around to answer questions, and um, thank you again for the invitation to speak.